Ah, making a video. Half of this video, day 23? I don't know, something like that. Anyway, you figure it out. Uh, so anyway, I guess I will... Uh, I'm thinking brain states. I'm thinking uh, the nature of the beast. So we're back sort of to lizard, ape, something more, the intelligence thing. But there is a difference between certain brain functions, the brain functions that create our our sense of the world, our feelings, our emotions. Well, let's say feelings first. Ouch. Um, burn, hot, cold, hunger, blah, blah, blah. Then on top of that layer, we have emotions, uh, passions, desires. Um, and then on top of that is the scheming mechanism, the thing that figures out a plan, a way to navigate the world. So one part of our brain is identifying what's in the world, good, bad, um, chase, run away, you know, the things that are hostile and, and um, likely to satisfy our desires. And the other brain is defining patterns, ways to navigate that stuff to satisfy the organism. Um, we, as humans, because of this intelligence thing, this abstract intelligence, where we can now think beyond the scope of just being one sentient being locked off from the other sentient beings, locked off from the knowledge of their consciousness, locked off from understanding of our own history and origin and biological function. Now we have that knowledge. That knowledge puts us on a a bigger game board, a bigger picture that we now exist in. It, 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 it enlarges the universe we exist in. It, um, it adds incredible detail to our understanding of the context of existence, the context of something else's existence. It creates whole new opportunities for um, storytelling and narratives and understanding things like um, you know walking in someone else's shoes and imagining what it would be like imagining it's a very powerful force that we have a very powerful faculty to imagine uh, to to have enough knowledge stored in our understanding to be able to mimic in our imagination the experience of the reality. And we can do this in very, you know, superficial ways as entertainment in terms of just daydreaming or fantasizing. And we can do this in very practically useful ways by imagining molecules combining and doing science and doing other things that require modeling and understanding and connecting and all of that mechanics understanding the mechanics so we can duplicate them in our imagination and we can run reality in our brain uh, pretty accurately. I mean, modeling is a huge word. I don't know whether I should title this modeling. So it's not really going to be about modeling, but um, maybe it is. Maybe it could be. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's the best part of our intelligence does this abstract thinking, Does this has this capacity to step beyond the carrot stick organism, the like, dislike, the want, um, you know, attractive, repulsive. That's how part of our system is reacting to the world. It's saying that's attractive, that's repulsive. Now we have this ability to imagine more. We find elements in that even, even in our imagination, repulsive and attractive. Um, and our brain schemes so another good concept word, the scheming mind, uh, it schemes solutions. It, it, it attempts to manufacture solutions by running scenarios, um, variations on the theme. Um, and uh, through that process, um, come up with solution to the problem of our repulsion, our our attraction. We need the satisfaction of the attraction or the satisfaction or resolution of the irritant, the annoyance, the, the, the thing that might be tedious or aggravating or irritating to our senses. 
and the thing that creates a hunger in us and a desire in us and a want in us. Um, but again, these are the forces that compel us as individuals. And we can use our intelligence to step beyond that and understand conceptually what's happening in the whole game. So we can understand that it's a game, that there are pieces, that there are players, that we're all players in the game, that we're all attempting to navigate in some sort of reasoned, schemed manner uh, to gain our satisfaction, and that it is uh, logically intuitive. I don't know if that's a good word. It is the nature of logic uh, to discover, to realize, uh, to find um, that um, value exists in these other creatures. We innately feel it because of the conditioning, because again, the biological reaction um, attaches us to our family, our the things we're raised with, uh, the things we become comrade with, um, and we gain an empathy and a, a, de a desire to protect them and uh, concern for their welfare. And if, we're, if we gain this faculty of logic, um, it becomes logically intuitive, obvious, um, natural, to start extending um, that value system and to understand that the, the barriers aren't things like an ugly face or fat or um, maybe not too bright or some other stupid thing, wrong color eyes or some other idiotic idea that would separate me from it, that it is just as real as me. Uh, th these are obvious logical conclusions that the sensing beings, we're all just sensing beings, and our welfare is all important. And then an intelligence almost automatically starts separating through that kind of simple logic. It's function from not only being something that functions for this individual, but it functions for a society, or it functions for a culture, or a nation, or however your race even. People attach to lots of things. Um, but a person could logically recognize that, yeah, I'm in it for the, 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 the tribe, the gang, the, the civilization, the all comers who, who come with merely a, a handful of, of vulnerability. They just have to come, they have to just show up and say, I'm vulnerable to being harmed, um, worry for me. And maybe a, an intelligence would say, yes, they deserve inclusion. They, they can be harmed. They're included in my, in my network of concern, in my network of welfare that matters. Um, and yeah, that's what becomes this, this empathetic, caring um, intelligence. That's what defines intelligence, is in a sense being able to recognize these simple truths of our existence that we can't steal from each other and win, that we can't harm each other to our benefit, and that it's no more illogical than for you to think it would be a good thing for somebody to harm you for their gain. You can certainly understand how that doesn't make sense because you experience the harm, you recognize its negative value, you imagine the the value of the gain, and you say there's no way their gain could possibly equal the harm they just imposed on me. We can understand these simple math, and uh, you can see the hypocrisy in humans, though, because they, they seem to be able to see it when they're on the wrong end of that exchange, but when on their on the beneficial end, um, all of a sudden, uh, their empathy degrades their rational um, ability to <laughs> to see the obvious uh, disappears and all of a sudden the rationalizations show up that the other thing doesn't feel as much as them. It's not worth it. It deserves it because it did something wrong. <laughs> it's not one of them, period. It's good enough reason often. It's a Muslim, <laughs> you know. Good enough reason for it to be in pain. Um, just nonsense. 
And uh, so anyway, the the the, what I'm, the point I'm really getting to here is that your intelligence, if it's going to do rational things, it's not going to itself personally have an investment. It's not gonna it's not gonna react to that's repulsive, that's attractive. It's going to react to things based on that's value rich, that's value deficit. That's it's it's going to become utilitarian. It's going to become it's going to define value based on the entire cash register receipts of the day. It's not going to. It's going to take a net um, um, value. It's going to judge the system, not individual players in the system. That wouldn't be rational. It would understand that you don't rationally judge based on one roll of the dice that you roll all the dice over and over again to decide what dice do. Uh, you, um, you have to run it to know what it costs, to know what the real price is. Uh, so a brain looks at a longer term and a wider field, and so that wider field includes all these other sentience and the whole interaction and the whole function of the, um, the machinery of life and draws its conclusions, um, draws its approximations even, but it just starts saying, well, what's happening here? What, what's in the positive side and what's on the negative? What's being gained and what's being paid? And just make the simple equations based on its own understanding of what pain and suffering is, and its own understanding of what um, a satisfied desire is. And... Um, balancing that equation. And we can certainly all define the extremes. So we all can say, I think quite honestly, that a chocolate cupcake, if it cost one child having cancer, <laughs> it wouldn't be worth it. That wouldn't be good enough. Um, one cupcake, no. You have to produce more than that to justify the pain. Uh, and so it's getting, when you get closer and finer, and trying to slice this is that's when the, it gets uh, uh, difficult. But I think if it is looked at as just a system and you say, is any of the need generated from anything real? Or is it all just, I like the Yankees and some other guy says, I like the Mets. The point is they just like. They need to like something. They need to need something. It's going to be anything. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> and that's the problem here is that the need is a self-justifying need. It's replication for the sake of replication. It's satisfaction for the sake of a satisfaction that doesn't need to exist. And all the only thing that says any of this should continue is a perception in people's heads. There's no rational imperative in the universe. There's no words in the universe screaming out loud or written, written out there logically that say, the human race needs to exist. And we can understand how clear that is because we can understand how obvious it is that we don't think the Martians need to exist. And we don't think the Platonians need to exist or the Uraniites or the Munikins or the uh, Merconians. None of these imaginable civilizations do we have any urgent perception that it needs to exist because it isn't a logical need. The only thing that needs to, we need it because we perceive a need, not because the need is something we're recognizing. So there's a huge difference between you show up at a car accident and there's a, a person in a trapped car that's on fire, they're in pain, you can see the need to resolve their suffering. You can see the need to go attempt a rescue, uh, to do something. Um, but life doesn't do that. Life doesn't save something from harm. Life puts something at jeopardy. It opens the door to harm. It opens the door to risk, vulnerability, horror, trouble. And it doesn't do it for a good reason. Yes, it has some side benefit of this perception of victory as you climb out of your dungeon of, of, of deprivation and gain your satisfaction. You have your moments in the sun, and they are glorious, but they are just moments and they are only glorious because of the hell you were put in first. Anyway, probably enough. But intelligence makes this 
visible and intelligence changes your brain from a scheming tool that's scheming for an individual into a scheming tool that's scheming resolution of the dilemmas that are all over the life equation. There are problems with this system. There are problems with this mechanism. And intelligence wants a solution. Your intelligence should demand a solution. It shouldn't settle. It should say, make it right, or you don't make it. I mean, it's intuitively sensible not to make messes, not to risk disaster if you don't have to. Till next time.